I don't think we found any records that Richard owned slaves. And, um, we do know that Richard's brother, George Cameron Mendenhall, held slaves, and they were inherited through his first wife, Eliza Dunn. And it is said that she inherited over 50 slaves from her deceased father. Um, some of this history is a little sketchy. I'll tell you what I know. Anyhow, she inherited these slaves from her father. And so upon their marriage, I mean, George Cameron was one of the leading abolitionists actively opposing slavery in Guilford County. And when he was married sometime, I think it was 1824, 1825, to Eliza Dunn, he became the second leading slaveholder in the county. I know that Thomas Dunn, in particular, was close friends with George Cameron when they served in the state legislature. And they lobbied for you know, getting the railroad of, um, through here. They lobbied for education and other such things. I'll work towards those things. And then it's said that both Eliza and George were abolitionists, except George had a different way of carrying through on that, or not carrying through on it. Um, Eliza um, really had a close relationship with Richard, especially in regard they, they shared um, a lot of common views in regards to, to abolition. And I think she, more than George even, had a yearning to free these people. Well, unfortunately, Eliza passed away about a year into their marriage. Um, and you think about this, um, they're just married, and all, you know, all of a sudden, really, you have these 50 people that you have to care for, you have to provide you know, have dwellings for. Make sure they have something to do. They're productive, and of course, that they're healthy. And and so what they did is they built these one-room log houses. Many of them with dirt floors on the bluff above the house. The house itself actually sat on the bluff overlooking Deep River, the valley. And so up above, there were these little log houses that were built for the families, and and they generally lived as families. That's our understanding. And many of them were hired out to like-minded Quakers, you know, who George and, El and excuse me, and Eliza trusted, you know, would care for them and treat them properly. Well, Eliza dies, as I said before, and George Cameron is a widower for for a couple of years. Then he marries a woman named Delphina Gardner, solid Quaker. Well, let, let me put it to you this way. George Cameron, when he married Eliza, he married out of, out of unity. And of course, that was a practice. You know, if you married out uh, a non-Quaker, you were disowned. You were pushed out of meeting, which of course is what happened to George Cameron. Um, he would have been disowned anyway, of course, for having slaves, more than likely. Well, at any rate, Delphina, a solid Quaker, when she married George, she was not disowned, which is an interesting point. I think it's kind of offers a bit of insight in her standing in the meeting. Now, um, Delphina was a truly amazing lady, uh, highly educated. She owned her own library, which in that time was really unheard of, even amongst uh, uh, Quakers, as you know. Um, and she brought her own library into the marriage. But anyway, Eliza had her own firm beliefs on what should be done. And it's understood by most that she kind of nudged George Cameron. Letters of Harriet Peck mentions that uh, George Cameron was satisfied with the idea of giving his son, James Ruffin Mendenhall, from his first marriage to Eliza, um, the honor of freeing the slaves, um, which is really interesting. Um, and I'm sure there were a lot of uh, people in his position, Quakers who were slave owners who were kind of uh, wrestling with these feelings of knowing that this is really a wicked practice, but yet feeling that they're doing good by the slaves and being uh, fearful of what would happen if you freed them. And also keep in mind that um, you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but from the late 1700s, 
uh, well through the Civil War, it was illegal in the state of North Carolina to free your slaves within the state. Well, anyway, at any rate, um, I think Delphina had played a key role in this. Eventually, the decision was made to, to manumit the, the slaves, or at least to begin the process. And as early as 1854, um, George and Delphina helped them um, free uh, at least 28 individuals. And there's a good recording of that. Uh, thankful, there were many mission papers uh, filed, registered at Logan County, Ohio, so we have a good accounting of who these people were, which is it's a wealth of information, especially for descendants. And we've met a couple. I've met a couple of them in the last few years. I've been associated with Mendenhall uh, Plantation. So there, it kind of went fits and starts. Uh, they mainly helped escort them to freedom personally. And I know that uh, a number of them were, were freed. Uh, well, you see, you know, they started out with just over 50. And it said that the number swelled as high as over 80. You have natural reproduction. But also, it's been said that George and Delphina would purchase relatives of the slaves that they held, brothers, sisters, wives, and husbands, in some cases, who lived nearby. And not only that, of course, word gets around um, and said that slaves would come, especially those who were mistreated, would come to George and Delphina pleading for them to purchase them. And it said that they did indeed purchase them and then help them, you know, escape and want to freedom, essentially. Um, George passed away. He drowned crossing the Aurora River in 1860. George um, was an attorney and he ran, the, he was a part of the, the, I think he was on his way to circuit court session, if I remember correctly. And he also had his own law school, which was established in the 1830s, lasted for about 10 years, known as Telmont. It was one of the first law schools in this section of the state. 